Greetings and welcome everyone to the Frankfurt School on Popular Culture, Part 2. Uh, in this mini lecture, we're just going to take a look at a, a few examples and to kind of further emphasize or, or more specifically hone in on popular culture. Part 1 of this mini lecture series just tried to explain some of the way, some of the theoretical background of the Frankfurt School, and here we're going to emphasize a little bit more of the, the role popular culture plays. So one thing, and this might be a little bit over over the top, but one of the things that pop that you see within critical theory, or, or more important, from some of the Frankfurt School uh, theorists, is this idea that popular culture, to a certain degree, is here to enslave you. Uh, and there, I have an image from uh, *Night of the Living Dead*, and it's interesting. You know, *Dawn of the Dead* by George Romero was also a very a very interesting critique that certainly ties into uh, the Frankfurt School and its criticism of consumerism. All right, so I talked before about the culture industry, and the way this is understood is that the culture, the culture industry or industry as a whole, um, is constantly producing things. And in particular, the culture industry or cultural industry, its purpose is to continually produce new things. And this is, you know, this is what, this is this power of purchase, um, this idea that there are new things to acquire and that people want to exercise their power. And in a capitalist society, one of the biggest forms of power is, of course, the power to purchase. And so if you can purchase new things, there's status related to that. There's, you know, you're communicating things about your role within that culture. So... The ind industries continually produce new things, and again, if we think about this, um, you know, there's these the new generation of this, so there's the new, uh, you know, we constantly see new products. Look at your grocery store. Look at, you know, the typical typical grocery store ha sells over a hundred thousand individual distinct products, right? And each of these, you know, you see new things coming out in the grocery store every day. And all of these new things will often distract us from real world change. Uh, that is, we exist in this simulated life. Uh, we're existing, we're engaging, um, but we're constantly distracted by new things and not necessarily by the real world. Uh, if you're too busy contemplating which version of a chocolate cereal to purchase, you're not really thinking about the larger issues or the larger things going on in the world. It's hard for you to maintain your attention to the world when you know you go down the cereal aisle and there's 5,000 different cereals to choose from and so what happens is that we're distracted from that real world but we also see that these things cement um, cement us to our world uh, they keep us invested in that immediacy of that world in that you know in that culture industry think about how many conversations that you have with your friends around consumer goods whether it's video games whether it is your phones your apps right they, these things connect us to our world even though it's a simulated world or it's a simulated life we're not most of us aren't deeply involved or deeply committed to real world change. We're committed to, boy, how can I, you know, how can I gain money so I can own a house? Or even though owning a house doesn't actually impact or affect the world in any significant way. Again, these are ideas that, that come through from the Frankfurt School. So uh, Dominic Sternati is somebody I, I, I really like his uh, approach and discussions of popular culture. He says, popular culture does not necessarily hide reality from people, nor are they directly duped or tricked by it. Rather, they are led to recognize how difficult it is to change the world and to value the respite. Uh, popular culture of offers. So, you know, what, what Sternati is saying here is basically, it's not that people are doing this in a conscious way to hide from reality. But they, people are recognizing that to actually have an impact on the world can be tremendously challenging, especially, again, with the, the system the way it is set up. And so rather than take on the onslaught to really face that challenge, it's, it can be at times easier 
to opt into popular culture. Uh, and this, this is again, you know, something will, this is builds off of mass culture theory as we'll talk about in, in the third lecture, but um, it's just something to, to be aware of that this is how the, this is the critique that uh, the Frankfurt School has in talking about or presenting this culture industry. And so the industry process revolves around a few concepts. Uh, the first is standardization, and that is getting something to be universalized. So cars uh, were really, you know, the standardization of the mid 20th century, as were televisions. Today, smartphones would be standardization. The idea that almost everybody or many people are using or have cell phones. I mean, how quickly cell phones became almost ubiquitous in society is unprecedented. Uh, but that's the first part of the industry process. The second part is, of course, pseudo individualization. And this is superficial differences, uh, shades of the same or inundation of choice. And I, I mentioned there again, the cereal aisle. Um, but superficial differences. A good example is when you have the, the debates between Mac and PCs. That is really superficial difference because for the vast majority of what people do, there is no real difference. Um, there's difference of where you click, but there's no real difference of, how, of what you do with those things. But people get into fierce debates. And in fact, Mac or, or Apple has really done well at you know, branding itself for people to, to, to believe well enough that Macs are something different, that people pay, you know, hundreds of dollars more for Mac products, even though they're really shades of the same thing. They're, they're both PCs. Um, so the pseudo individualization emphasizes or pushes people to, you know, potentially pay more or to, uh, somehow feel like if they have one thing, then this other thing's different and they might need to, or be desiring to acquire it. So the culture industry gives us uh, choices, but those, but of degree, right? So again, you know, I have an example here of a bunch of different iPods, right? Ooh, look, they're all different, but really they're still an iPod. You still need an iTunes account. Or you still need to use iTunes on a computer in order to load music. You still need iTunes account if you want to purchase music to use on these. Um, it's different, but superficially, and it doesn't really provide, it really doesn't actually give people anything new or distinct, something that's completely different. And then the other piece of this is that profits determine cultural forms. And what that means is how you can purchase, how much you can profit off it is going to determine exactly what kind of forms it takes. And what I have right there is a picture of disposable razors. Now, if we're being environmentally sound or if we were just being, you know, thinking responsibly, most people would not use disposable razors because, of course, they're not environmentally sound. They're, they're very much wasteful. But because they're extremely profitable, people use disposable razors. Or at least we've been told it's easier to use disposable razors. There's questions about that. And how, how quickly they are supposedly disposable. Uh, you find this with all sorts of things that, you know, profit determines the cultural forms. That you have the culture industry deciding, well, how often do we, you know, do we want or encourage people to use this? And they do this in two ways. One is they create the products to be disposable. Think about things like the Swiffer, right? So mops have worked for hundreds of years, but now so many people have the Swiffer. And what does the Swiffer do? It commits you to having to regularly buy more Swiffer products. You need to continue to buy the sheets and things like that. Uh, well, very, you know, very similar with, with razors. Um, and another piece of this that, that we see embodied in this is this idea of planned obsolescence. And this is the idea, of course, that a company really determines could actually make products last much longer, but say, no, we don't want to do that. Why would we want to do that and cut into profits? Instead, planned obsolescence is a strategic approach to limiting how long something lasts. iPods are a great example of that. Notice you cannot access the battery on an iPod. In order in 
as your iPod goes along, its life, you know, it, it, your ability to use it starts to diminish to the point at which you then need to buy a new iPad, iPod or iPad or iPhone. And of course, Apple does this very, very sophisticatedly where, you know, at a certain point, and this is almost annually, they, rele they release a new version, right? The iPod is on something like generation 16 um, or, or some, you know, is into the double digits in terms of generations, even though an iPod's only been around for about 12 to 15 years. Uh, at this time, I, th I want to say about 12 years, 12 to 10 years. Uh, so it's fascinating that, you know, or, or it's a great example of what Frankfurt School was very critical of is this idea of they keep pushing out these new products even though they're not that new or the changes are somewhat superficial. You know, there might be a decent amount of change from the first iPod to the one today, but not a lot if you really think about it. Uh, not a lot, uh, not enough to have 10 generations of iPods uh, saying it needs to go through 10 different changes. And the idea that, you know, your iPod isn't necessarily going to work after a couple of years and there's nothing you can do about that uh, speaks to that idea of planned obsolescence. Another way to talk about this and think about this is the, almost the cycle of, um, uh, th th there's a certain amount of cycle or reinvestment in the system that Frankfurt School was critical of when looking at popular culture and looking at how um, the culture industry works. And I think coffee is a great example. Uh, so in our culture, we are very, very major coffee drinkers. I know myself, I'm extremely guilty of this. And think about our relationship with coffee. We get up in the morning and we drink our coffee. In fact, nowadays we drink our coffee several times throughout the day. But we get up and we drink our coffee and we drink our coffee so that we can function, right? We can, we can wake up, we can, you know, have our brains be cleared, have our body have some energy. And we function so, of course, that we can go to work. And we work really hard, we work really long, and when we're done with work, we often seek entertainment. Uh, we often seek things to just relax ourselves or to de-stress or to, you know, unwind. That entertainment can be a rock show or it can be, you know, staying up and watching the late night show. And because we have so much work and because that inf encourages us to seek more entertainment, um, that actually creates a lack of rest in us, which then means we don't sleep as much or we don't sleep as well, which means when we get up in the morning, we are going to need more coffee. And as you can see, this is a bit of a cycle that we go through. Um, and, and maybe this isn't your cycle, but I bet if you looked, you could find similar cycles of which, you know, one thing feeds into another and all of these things reinvest us in uh, the culture industry, reinvest us in capitalism. And again, this is not me saying this is what we do and this is, um, this is bad or anything like that. This is what the uh, Frankfurt School was critiquing or at least identifying as challenges in our culture. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching and see you in the next video.